Good morning again. Today's uh, scripture reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, and it's in two parts. There's, uh, let's say it's from chapter 11, and there's two verses, and then there's a group of four verses after it. And the first two verses are fairly understandable, but the last four verses uh, are not as easily understandable because as written in the Bible, uh, there are a lot of pronouns in there that don't have obvious reference. And so uh, what I've done is I've substituted the first they for with uh, the word the Israelites, the words the Israelites. And so the you in the second part, you can think of as us, meaning uh, the Christian Gentiles that uh, Paul's addressing. And the they in the second part is the Israelites. Okay, listen now to the words of Paul. I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of the Israelites' disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. Amen. Well, I am thrilled to introduce our preacher today, the Reverend Shonda Rani Jaw. Shonda is the executive director of the Oakland Peace Center, which is a collaboration of a bunch of different nonprofits that have um, that are sharing space and sharing resources to work for peace and justice in the Oakland area. She is also um, ordained in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. She's a, a well-known and wonderful anti-racism educator. She's an author and just an all-around advocate warrior for peace and justice. And I can't wait to hear what she's going to do with this, uh, this text. <laughs> so let me uh, stop sharing here so we can um, see Shonda. And you can unmute yourself there, Shonda. And welcome. Thank you so much. It is such a gift to be with this congregation. I am a big fan of yours. And have been with you in a couple of different ways, uh, with a book group you did a while back, with uh, one of your movie groups. Uh, one of our staff was with the interfaith uh, advocacy organization that y'all are a part of last year. Uh, so y'all are very much in my heart. Now, I do wanna say the downside of itinerant preaching, uh, I'm not in a congregation every single Sunday. And when I was pastoring one church, you know, sometimes the message I got from the lectionary was a really perky message. And sometimes it was really intense. And sometimes it was really heartwarming. And sometimes it was really nerdy. And in a regular church where I was preaching every Sunday, that would even out. Um, but since I'm in a different church every Sunday, it's kind of pick a mix. You never know what you're going to get from me on a given Sunday. And you all drew the nerdy sermon straw. Uh, now that said, I know how brilliant your ministry team is. And I know how thoughtful and deeply reflective you all are. And so I know this is not the first nerdy sermon you've ever heard. So I expect you to be able to hang in there with me. I have kind of a theory that evangelicals hear a little bit too much from the Apostle Paul and progressive Christians far too little. So my hope is that this message isn't too redundant because it's very much about Paul, uh, one of the first Christian evangelists in our community. Will you be with me in an attitude of prayer? May the words of my mouth 
and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Christ. Amen. My mother is uh, from Scotland, still has the accent. My father was from a small village in India. And on one of my trips to India, my cousin said to me that I was more adaptable to modern India than my father, who was born and raised there. I was so proud of that compliment, and she meant it as a compliment, I, who never quite belonged anywhere I went, that I didn't think about how sad that was. When my father finally returned to India, it was not the place that he had left. We did not have the money to go back regularly. All of my parents' money was going back to support our family. And so it was 10 years before he returned, and then another 10 and then another 10. And each time he went back, the country had shifted radically and become less and less familiar each time. And so while this country over and over made him out to be the other, this was the familiar place to him, the place that was home, because his wife and daughter shared the same landscape with him. I mention this because while I'm not a diehard fan of the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter that we heard this morning, my heart breaks when I read the first line of our scripture for today. I ask then, has God rejected God's people? By no means, says Paul. And Paul wouldn't have written it if some of his folks weren't feeling that way. And they were feeling that way because of the changes in their church. When we're looking at stories from 2000 years ago, some guesswork and some puzzle pieces have to be put together for us to actually understand what was going on. But reading the text only through our modern day lens is actually a little creepy. So let's give it a shot. Paul, who, as you may know, was a Jewish convert to Christianity, was writing to the fast-growing church in Rome many miles away. Rome, as you know, was one of the political powerhouses of the globe and made its influence felt across three continents. Rome housed quite a few Jewish people. And when some of those Jewish people became followers of Jesus, non-Jewish Romans got curious and expressed interest in following the same man as their Christ or savior. And so the Jewish Christians taught them all of the rituals and rules and scriptures and rites of passage that Jesus had followed so that they could grow closer to Jesus and be a part of the emerging faith tradition of Christianity, a Christianity shaped by Jewish ritual. But in maybe the year 45, the Roman Emperor Claudius evicted all Jewish people from Rome, including the Jews who followed Jesus as their Christ. It wasn't the first time Jewish people would be persecuted in what is now called Europe, and it would be followed by many more evictions, pogroms, and efforts to eliminate a whole people. Jewish people were already suspect by the Roman Empire because part of why the empire was so successful was that any time they showed up to conquer a place, they said, you can keep your gods, just add Caesar as one of them. That didn't work with the Jewish people for whom there was only one God. And since they were literally marked for their faith, they could only blend in so much. When the emperor said go, they went. That meant that the Christ followers who blended in with Roman society, who weren't marked in the same way, got to stay. 
while the people who had taught them their faith were forced into exile for maybe 10 years. When Paul writes his letter to the church in Rome, he reminds the Jewish Christians to focus on the important part, that the new converts follow the teachings of love and compassion, of mercy, not necessarily all of the Jewish rituals. But at this point in the letter, he's also extending compassion to them. After years in exile, the Jewish Christians who are in conflict with their Jewish family and who have been exiled from their home for being Jewish, they have now come back home to a place that is not the home they left. Non-Jewish Christians have abandoned the practices the Jewish Christians taught them and are making up new practices and new rituals with no accountability and no concern for the impact this will have on the people who brought them into the faith in the first place. To me, and I hope you'll forgive me for this, it's a metaphor for how dangerous Christianity is in the hands of people used to being in power, used to having privilege. So when Paul says to this community, recently reunited and yet divided, that God has imprisoned all in disobedience, it sounds like a harsh word, but Paul is offering a word of incredible generosity to the non-Jewish Christians and asking a lot of his fellow Jewish Christians. And he's also casting a vision for the future of Christianity that is so beautiful and that has not yet fully come to pass, except in small glimpses every once in a while. I occasionally read Paul's letters and wonder, if he could see us now, would he regret giving us so much latitude? I don't think Christianity was designed to handle the structural weight of being a culturally dominant religion. I think it was a protest against the excesses of authoritarian abuses of power. And it was an alternative way of living in radical inclusion and radical horizontality. And somewhere, we took a wrong turn, and here we are instead. But it's not too late for us to save Christianity and realign with Christ. And I think Paul's message is an important one for us too. Whether we have power in this society, whether we are marginalized in this society, or whether we have power but aren't willing to admit it yet. God has not rejected you. God has not rejected me. And God has not rejected the gifts of the people in our community who have been exiled, who have returned, and who do not recognize what we have made of this place. Your gifts and mine, the gifts of returning family who were incarcerated, the gifts of indigenous people reclaiming the land of their ancestors, the gifts of people displaced and now seeking to return to the land they know, the gifts of young black protesters in the streets demanding access to the things that have been withheld for too long, the gifts of people moving back with family, the gifts of elders who were being forced into isolation because of this brutal disease. God has not rejected the gifts of people whose history with God goes way back. For as Paul reminds us, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. 
Paul was saying this as a word of comfort to his Jewish Christian siblings in Rome who were feeling unmoored and unvalued, exposed and at risk. And he was saying it in a letter he knew that his more privileged non-Jewish Christian family would hear too in the hopes that they would know it to be true and that they would extend love and appreciation and compassion and mercy to their newly returned and agitated and overwhelmed Jewish Christian siblings. I wonder who the modern day equivalent of our unmoored and agitated, newly returning siblings are for this church, for this community, for this nation. And like Paul offered comfort to some and encouragement to mercy for others, may we likewise recommend, recognize where our power and God's mercy intersect in this moment and in the many moments of mercy and inclusion to come. Amen.